thank you very much for inviting me here, inviting us here. Loeen's uh, running the show, really, and, and my paws, uh, I've got some kind of shake, I don't know what it is, but um, Loeen wants, to, uh, wants me to announce that that's really why she's there. <laughs> she, 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 she feels uh, rather exposed. So, um, before I begin, I'm going to tell you a little story about uh, what I've called the dam busters, the dung beetles. Uh, in Western Australia and much of Southern Australia, um, when the uh, first colonists arrived, they cleared the land, the Mallee lands, and they, they uh, tried to build dams. But the dams wouldn't hold water. And so, um, <coughs> but after a few years, after, all the, after the microbes had got, got to work on the, um, like Lynn was saying, you know, they do lots of things, after the microbes got to work on the soil, the soil became compacted and um, then the dams would hold water again. So that went on for 150 years, thereabouts, and uh, they, the dams all held water. But then uh, along came a deep root, well, deep rooted perennials were always there, but say on Kangaroo Island, where I have a friend called Link Wilson, some of you know him, um, and he has, uh, he's had dung beetles over there for 20 years now. And what's happened on his place is that the deep rooted perennials, in, a, in association with the dung beetles, which go, go down to about 30 to 60 centimetres, have changed the hydrology of his property such that, and they've also changed the permeability of the soil, such that all of the water that uh, rains goes into the soil and flows across underneath in, into the creeks, and none of it runs off. So he's actually, ha he's, he's bulldozed his dams and put them back to pasture. So that's what I'm calling the dam busters. So it's... Um, Oh, uh, <laughs> no, I'm pressing. Uh, why don't you give the talk? <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, that, and that's what I consider to be a kind of a very nice re regenerative agriculture because uh, with the use of deep-rooted perennials, a wide diversity of pasture species and the dung beetles to improve the permeability of the, of the surface soil and take the water down into the subsoil, uh, we have gone back uh, to, towards what, what the, the land was originally. So today I'm going to do, talk to you about what dung beetles do, then um, talk to you about two new spring, spring species that we brought into Australia, um, Bubis bison and, and uh, Ontophagus vacca, but I, I, bu sorry, Bubis bubalis, and then a little bit on how to purchase uh, beetles, and if that's not from us, and a little bit about, a tiny bit about biochar. Now, I had a long chat with a various uh, aficionados of bloody biochar <laughs> and who have, have their own sceptical view of things. But <laughs> anyway, so uh, I'll talk very briefly about feeding biochar to cattle so that the uh, cattle crap it out and the dung beetles bury it and then it gets into the soil and... Uh, and improves the health of the cattle and um, possibly improves the health of the soil and certainly adds carbon to the soil. So, next please. So, oh yes, thank you. Where would I be without you, eh? <laughs> um, so, now um, we're going to have a lucky door prize. So I want you to think of a number between one and, f one and a hundred and uh, keep it to yourself. Don't cheat. I know I can't trust you, but you're probably... And the prize will be this magnificent book, which I, I wrote myself. And um, so, have you got your numbers? The magic number is 37. Who's closest to 37? Any in the 30s? Nobody in the 30s? Anybody in the 40s? 42. 42. Meaning of life. Yeah. Well, no, well, I said 37, so it's uh, okay. 42 is closer than 30. 30. <laughs> 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 you You're Thank you. Okay, okay. I'm on my clock. Okay, next please. Um, so, in the world there are about 9,000 species of dung beetle, and um, in Australia there are 400 odd species. Most of these native species don't deal effectively with cattle dung, and so we imported a whole lot of uh, uh, European and Southern um, African species into Australia. We've got 25 of these established, and there are quite 
reasonable numbers of them um, right across um, the summer rainfall and the winter rainfall region. So here's one species which did well, does well in the summer rainfall. That came from South Africa. This one here is limited. That's the limits of their distribution. So that, that's, um, that's the one that's uh, effectively by controlling the uh, bush fly, which we know is a, used to be a huge problem. It still is a problem here, as we all know. Uh, and uh, next. Um, as well as uh, having specific geographic uh, uh, limits, they also have seasonal distribution. So um, in, in southern Australia, there are summer beetles, winter beetles, autumn beetles, and spring beetles. So we were missing spring beetles, so we brought, we've brought some in. There's a very good winter, a couple of winter beetles. We're a bit short on autumn beetles, and the summer beetles do well. Um, so what do they do? Well, I'm going to briefly talk about the way in which they control uh, bush flies and intestinal parasites, and then I'll get on to this uh, soil stuff, which is really why you're here. But I have to beat the drum about how, how effective they have been in controlling uh, pests. So um, the bush fly has been a it come it breeds in southeastern Queensland and gets taken into the southern states on prevailing winds each spring. Um, in the southern states, the uh, summer active dung beetle uh, Taurus um, makes a great you can get ten five ten thousand in a dung pad and they completely. Uh, smash it up and dry it out uh, in, in a day or so. The uh, adult beetles feed on dung juices. The fly maggots feed on dung juices. And I'll be in the next slide, but not yet. The next slide is about the intestinal parasites. They, they, the, uh, the larvae of the intestinal parasites also feed on dung juices. Now, with the uh, drying out of the pads due to the activity of the, of the dung beetles, the maggots, for instance, take four to six days, where, and if you dry out the pad in two days, then they're gone. So um, that's why the bush flies have become uh, relatively rare in many of the uh, higher rainfall agricultural regions of southern Australia. But we still have a problem with spring, spring breeding. Next, please. Oh, we, yeah. We need desert beetles, um, and uh, there are, um, we spend a bit of time with Andrea Shuna, Shuna, and uh, with um, Francesca um, up wind, wind and away. Um, and it, it appears that even despite the drought in the last six months, there's been a, quite a surprising boom in uh, the activity of, uh, of these, uh, of at least four species of, of dung beetle. Next. Oh, well, I'm standing well away from it. I'm, I'm afraid of it. <laughs> okay, so um, in controlling uh, the intestinal parasites, dung beetles uh, can do quite a good job. And uh, next, and uh, when they, see this is uh, Australia, there's, that's, a few week, that's a week later, and uh, you know, th there's nothing left except the uh, clay soil that they, the beetles brought from the surface. So you'd get no fly survival or uh, parasite survival in those dung pads. Next. The last thing to say about this before we move on is that dung beetles are very susceptible to uh, certain, uh, the mectins, which are used for uh, chemical control of, the, of intestinal worms, of the gut worms. But uh, there is one mectin, which is moxidectin, and that is a dung beetle friendly one. Now, people argue, you know, they say, is it really dung beetle friendly? Well, in my view it is. There's very good evidence for it. Uh, and there's certainly good evidence that the others are highly toxic. Uh, but there are some uh, few porkies being told, really, about, say, abermectin. You know, they say abermectin's dung beetle friendly. Well, it ain't. Um, but at any rate, we just leave that there now. So uh, you do have to uh, think about your dung beetle populations if you are using uh, chemicals to control gut worms. So, next. So now I'm going to be talking about um, winter, this winter active beetle, Bubis bison. Um, um, and I hope you can get them in the future. We, talk, we, talk, we talked earlier, and she was writing down pubis bison, but it's... <laughs> 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 Next, please. <laughs> 
Um, so they do a whole lot of <laughs> a whole lot of things. <laughs> they tunnel into the soil. They go down to 40 to 60 centimetres, and that allows water to go in, aeration of the soil, reduced soil uh, bulk density, reduced erosion because the water is going into the soil instead of across at the soil surface. Uh, and it also puts in a whole lot of organic matter when so the, the beetles um, come out and they, f they initially feed uh, in shallow tunnels and then they, when they've matured their eggs they, they go, go deep into the soil to breed. And uh, when they do that they uh, bring a lot of subsoil to the surface. Uh, the, often the, the subsoils are clay, high in nutrients. Um, there's, they promote earthworms, so you get perhaps a doubling or a tripling of your earthworm populations in the soil. And the, dung be and the earthworms not only move uh, in the soil surface where they normally live, but now they go right down, it, right down through the soil profile. Um, and then the soil carbon, of course, well, I'll be telling you a bit about, about that. And the end result of all of that is that you get increased, the dung beetles result in increased pasture production. So next, please. So here, um, this is, um, <laughs> did I, hang on, sorry. God, bloody thing, I'm not going to use it. <laughs> God. Thank you for your help. Um, this is the, these are the tunnels of, of, um, of Bubis bison. Uh, at Bull Lagoon in South Australia, there were, you know, that's just absolutely common. You know, the, the dung in, in winter disappears within a day or so. Um, and here, this is a most amazing thing. Uh, this, is, this is a huge dung pad, and it had probably about a thousand beetles in it. And uh, it's a big beetle. And they, um, they go, they tunnel, when they're in feeding phase, they tunnel down to about 10 centimetres. And if they're crowded, they move sideways before they come out. When they come out, they leave an exit hole. So here, there were 640 exit holes in a, a space of um, a couple of metres. And so what the, that, that one dung pad had done was effectively ploughed a huge volume of soil. And if you were to tip a, a, a bucket of water onto, these, onto it, as we did, it just disappears, right? Tip it next door and it runs off down the hill. So uh, this is the way we we uh, get scientific data on that sort of thing rather than just the, the bucket measure. This is our daughter Pippa. That's the legs of her ex-boyfriend. And <laughs> we decided to cut him off. Um, uh, next one, please. And um, so what happens? Well, um, here, here you can, we, we have, oh, I meant to bring them in, but at any rate, these big onion bags, as you can see here, um, here's this, friend of ours excavating an onion bag from the soil um, and that's ha then you, you, you get the bag, dig a hole, put the bag in the hole, backfill it with soil, put dung on the top, introduce the beetles and then anywhere up to 17 years later, any, and one, seven, I'll be telling you some 17 year data, but at any rate then you pull it up and you can have a look, you can do it in your 10 centimetre uh, sections or whatever. We did it in, in a bit different from that. But down the bottom, this is what it looked like after 10 months. So here, that's without dung beetles. I know it's a bit stretched, but that was uh, nothing. And, and this is what, what the root system inside this bag looked like down, at, down the beach. Because the beetles uh, tunnel down to the bottom and lay, put their, uh, their um, dung masses down here in which they lay eggs and the, the uh, um, buried dung acts as a food source for the, uh, for the larvae. And so, uh, but the plant roots, this is a vine root, it goes in and it's just, you can see, absolutely chalk and cheese, right? So, you know, if, if Lynn were to come along here, she would find all sorts of uh, amazing things going on, I reckon. Next. And so this is, you can, here is uh, the um, tunnels. Oh, they, they line the tunnels with dung, and so the earthworms uh, love feeding on dung, and so they, they go down and follow the, follow the tunnels down, and you can see the plant roots following the tunnels down as well. This is from 50 centimetres. There's an introduced European earthworm. 
Aphorectodea trapezoides, I think it is, but I'm not sure. You all know that, wouldn't you? Yes. And here are the soil casts inside a, a tunnel, and this is the sort of difference you get with and without um, dung beetles. Next. So we did a whole lot of experiments, and this is what I was explaining about the soil core, and then we had dozens of them out in the paddocks, and we pulled them up at, at various intervals over, over three years, and we left, uh, left an extra set out there, and uh, we went back after 17 years and pulled it up. And I'll be telling you how in those soil cores there was a, an amazingly persistent effect of the single application of dung and dung beetles 17 years previously. Okay? So, um, but this is, this is just, this is at about, um, this is at two years, uh, after two years after the uh, dung beetle. So the, there was one burial act, and then um, two years later we pulled up the cores and looked at, looked at the um, various uh, chemical compositions of the, of the soil. And there were, of course, down the bottom, there were tunnels, uh, beet tunnels, and uh, we could separate out the tunnels and the surrounding soil and do the carbon and things on that. Next. So um, we set up set it up in September 2005. Um, we sampled at one, two, and three years, and again at 17 years, right? So that's what it looked like in the ground. You put your, no, that's okay. You put your dung, put your beetles in there, put the dung on top, and then tie it off, and uh, there's, there's your sort of um, experimental field cage in, in which the uh, dung beetles are confined to a soil core, uh, but the earthworms can move in and out, Plant roots can move in and out, moisture can move and out, in and out, and all of uh, Lynn's little little hoo has little ho haws can go in and out as well. Next, so I'm now going to the 17-year uh, data, um, and uh, so this is this is what it looked like when we pulled it up. We had great trouble finding it because the, um, the ma they'd shifted all the fences and but we did some really careful searching and we found them. And this is, this is what it looked like. That's what the base of the core uh, without dung beetles. So we had nothing, dung only, and dung plus beetles. There's no effect of surface dung ever. We never fe found an effect of surface dung. And, but the presence of the dung beetles, of course, burying the dung uh, uh, made a major difference. So that's what it looked like there. And the next one, um, you can see here. Uh, so there were plant roots going right down to the base of the thing. It was a completely different um, structure. And next. So when we, we analysed it for um, um, what we've got is, re what I, I put it down as recalcitrant and organic, if you like. You know, there are various ways you can classify it. But um, in, our, in this particular set of data, there was uh, no obvious transfer of um, carbon. So this is percent carbon, right? Um, and so and this is the um, organic or, um, yeah, that's fine. And this is the recalcitrant, the tough stuff down the bottom, which uh, stays there. So there was no evidence of, tr I know there is, you guys have got evidence of, of transfer, but in this particular instance, there wasn't, Lord knows. But the really important thing is, that, the, um, re that this uh, fraction was substantially increased, even after 17 years. Next. How long was the dung beetles? Um, when we, oh, they were, we put them in and about um, on the 30th of, of September, and they, they would have buried the dung over the next uh, two months, eight, six weeks to two months, and then they would have died. So they were only there for about uh, six weeks, during which time they buried a three-litre dung pad and put it down at the base of a 50-centimetre soil core. Did they then have offspring that just died? No, no, no. No offspring. Um, they just died. Um, um, the, uh, any, the offspring... If, Oh, yes, they made the ultimate sacrifice, actually. 
um, the broods that were down the bottom, of course, generated dung beetles, which is what you were talking about. Uh, but when they come up, they, um, they just escape through the mesh. Um, the, there's no dung for them to bury, so they have no, no, for, no impact upon the uh, nature of the uh, soil core. Okay, so what we, we reckoned was that with the 17-year cores and the previous lot, we had identical control carbon levels after 1, 3 and 17 years. But the, and the direct effect of the buried dung disappeared very quickly. We found that, you know, when we were digging them up over that uh, three-year period. And, but the background of stable carbon in this instance were not affected, but the levels of organic carbon were doubled. And we put that down to um, plant roots and microbes. So, um, you know, the, uh, so it, what, what happened, we, I consider, is that the dung beetles restructured the soil profile uh, and uh, allowed, they took uh, sub fertile subsoil to the surface and left a whole series of permanent tunnels down which the uh, roots and everything else um, went and then it established a new dynamic equilibrium. Um, okay. Yeah, and so the uh, end result of all of that is increased pasture production. So this is this is um, in tons, uh, tons per hectare of dry matter. Um, and you can see that in this particular case, there was no effect of, of, of dung on the surface. This was, comes from pl four square meter plots and from uh, other, well, we've also did plots that were um, 40 square meters in, in area. Um, so there's clear evidence that they that this kind of activity, not all dung beetle activity, but this kind of dung beetle activity, um, improves pasture production very considerably. Um, so, the, the next thing I'm going to deal with briefly is um, this absence of spring dung beetles. So, um, as, as I said, the spring dung beetles um, were very scarce. There are a couple of native species, but they didn't do much good. And so we went, to, we got some MLA supported a project to bring in two species, uh, Ontophagus vacca and Bubis bubalis. And um, this is the sort of distributions that they have in, in Europe and the predicted distributions in Australia. Um, next. Same with vacca. Uh, I wouldn't bother about vacca for you guys, or you know, we, uh, I'm very uncertain about that. Um, it's it's got a peculiar life cycle, and it's um, it has it, it it's active in spring, but it comes out again. It has a egg to adult during uh, spring and early summer, and it comes and it comes out at exactly the same time as does Ontophagus taurus, which can be present in uh, the tens of uh, or you know thousands per dung pad. And they stratify the dung pads um, in a very short period of time, and so I, I'm uncertain about how the how vacca will cope with the with that high level of competition. But uh, bubalis, that's the one you saw previously, um, that will be a great. It's going to be a, one of the uh, most important beetles. So we'll have um, winter and spring covered in in some high rainfall regions. Next. So next. So what happened was we brought them into Australia in 2012. Um, they stayed in the CSIRO labs for um, a couple of years. And then they, w sadly, they were not very uh, effective in breeding them. And um, we, we got, um, we actually got um, 240 beetles, but I divided them between three locations. And we, we ended up with, at this location in uh, Strathalban, we started off with 75 beetles, so that's a very small number. Um, by 2017, there was 13,000, and now, you know, that we've, we've just got huge numbers, and uh, you can, uh, you, if you want, you can, you can get them. And this is, these are the kinds of that's our, one of our earlier efforts at mass rearing them, and now they're using these um, 
what we call hoop houses, to mass rear them. And uh, one of the things that's happening is that people are getting, uh, Greg Dalton supplies a, um, a kind of a package for, and with, with dung beetles and with a cage for a field cage and with advice for two years. And um, so you can start um, your personal colony on your property um, in a very short, um, with a very small number of beetles, you know, 100 or 150, instead of waiting for these uh, beetles. To, normally the beetles are, are field cropped and then redistributed. So it took about 20 years for bison uh, in Western Australia to become sufficiently abundant so that we could catch it in the field and then distribute it across southern Australia. But with this system, um, we're, short, we're taking that 20 years back to about five, I reckon, or less. And uh, so, you know, it's, it's possible to get these species established. Wind up next, please. Okay, this is actually the last slide. <laughs> I didn't see you stand up, did you? Um, this is our friend Doug Powell, who's, who's a, um, a biochar and a pioneer in feeding biochar to cattle, and he, he gives it to them now. He used to give it to them with molasses, but now they just eat it like that. They've got ad lib supply, and it in, they're, they're in top condition. He has no um, worm problems. Um, it, but there is some data now which shows that you get a seriously, if you, uh, you can get a 40 40% reduction in the amount of methane that's produced, and uh, you also get increased soil carbon. So that's it, folks. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.